If you're interested in advertising your brand, business, product, or talent on Hip Hop News Uncensored right before every video that we do, email advertise at hiphopun.com. That's advertise at hiphopun.com. We got a three-day sale going on right now. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Slots are filling fast. I look forward to hearing from you real soon. Let's get it. At, yeah, at the height of the rivalry, um, he had DJ Envy going back and forth with Funk Flex and everything like that. It got real. Oh, I, I went back and forth with, with Flex. He I, I was going to ask you that. That was my next question. But go, go oh. ahead. Talk about it. Talk about it. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I, was, I said, go ahead. Talk about your uh, going back yeah, and forth. Yeah, no. I mean, you know, I was on at night. I was different. I wasn't trying to be Funk Master Flex. I wasn't trying to be anybody else but myself. I came on, I had a, I had my strategy was they don't, they talk at the audience. I'm going to talk to the audience. I'm going to talk with the audience. And that is what it was like shaking hands and kissing babies, shaking each, anybody that I put on the radio, that was like a handshake and a kiss to every, and, and for that burrow, that was for that hole, but like it just, that's what I was doing, planting seeds. And my ratings started chipping away at his. And when that happened, mm. he started going crazy, calling me a bitch on the air. Wow. How did that make you feel? Because I'm sure prior to that. It was so. Yeah, right. Imagine someone that in your mind that's so powerful in the industry. Think about it. How many people shout out Funk Master Flex? How many people talk about dropping bombs? How many people talk about that radio station, that entity? Mm -hmm. That was so, I, I was crushed. Man, I felt so defeated. I cried. I felt weak. I felt, mm -hmm. I felt just defeated. I felt so defeated, but I didn't let anybody know that. I went home and I was, I licked my wounds. I drank my chamomile tea and I came back in and I was like, Lord, give me the strength to just keep going. And I just kept going. My ratings just kept being solid. I was like, I just, I'm just going to, um, please guide me. <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, but my numbers were crazy. You know, and, and, and people let me know, like they, they are, have told people, hi, Cherry. And we're not fucking with you. You know, the nightlife, like they really just wanted, you know, they, they were considered the evil empire. Mm. If anybody in radio knows, like Hot 97, the evil empire, they tried to shut us down in so many ways. It was like, oh, you go over there, you give them an interview, we're not playing your record. You okay. do the, I mean, they played hard ball. They did not get, they went out with a fight. But it didn't work. Did you ever get to talk to Flex? Did you guys ever yes. get to reconcile? Talk about that. He he hit me up when I when you know when the whole Fetty Wap situation happened. He started shouting me out on the radio. I see you, Cherry Trap Queen. Uh, then you know we talked, and he's like, I will never, ever, ever do no shit like that again. Like he, That's you good. know, he he apologized. You know, so you know we're good now. Dope. Um, so then, you know, everything started open up and my husband came home from prison. So it's just been uh -huh. <laughs> a crazy uh -huh. ride. And now it's almost 2022. It's like, damn, More. you know, no. you're getting old. <laughs> well, no. I don't like to speak for everybody else, but I just feel like the years are passing by so fast. Yeah. Right. Now let's, let's go back a little bit. Because um, as you talked about, like the media and everything, you know, you can set up anywhere. It wasn't always like that. You know, I'm sure you come up in a time where, you know, you guys pretty much had to go through the radio. So t talk to us, you know, about your humble beginnings, where you grew up and your journey all the way up into getting into broadcast media. So I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. And if anybody knows about Boston, it's very, it's, it's. It's a beautiful city, you know, it's close to New York. So you have that, you know, go getter mentality. It's a top 10 market. So, you know, we're not too far behind, but in terms of culture and, yeah. you know, it, it, the culture is there, but in terms of the culture, you know, being acknowledged by the powers that be, it just wasn't there. So, you know, it was something that I knew that I was going to have to leave, you know, um, 
the good thing is that there was some examples, you know, new edition, new kids on the block. Um, they gave us hope, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but we did have a, a radio station. It was a it was an AM station. It was the only urban station, you know, in the city, and it was on from sunup to sundown. And there was like some serious heavy hitters that worked at that station. I don't know if Boston was a hub. I don't know if it was because we have great colleges and we have those you know college radio stations. But some of the top talent passed through that place, and I was blessed to be mentored by some of those people. Stephen Hill. He's the one who really gave me my shot in radio. So um, yeah, it was community oriented. It was, you know, I had a buzz when there was no social media. You know, I don't know how that happens. I guess people hop on the phone. You know what I mean? And they're talking on the phone because that's really all that it could be. Um, and it was fun. It was fun. You know, I, I liked it, you know, but I think if, if we had what we had before, I would probably would have blown up like crazy because, you know, me and my friends and just my circle of people, we were really out there doing what we needed to do, you know, planting those seeds and just, like I said, out in the community. So, um, you know, when I graduated college, I got a job immediately. I went to Chicago, uh, Detroit, Philadelphia, Los Angeles. You know, the L.A. thing was crazy because my dream has always been to be on Hot 87. Growing up, that was the station because it was mm -hmm. like, yo, there's a hip hop station, like for real, for real, yeah. you know, full blast. Um, they're yeah. not playing any games. They got Wu-Tang on in the middays. You know what I mean? It was yeah. just it was like, what? What is this station? And it was ran by this white guy that looked like a rock star. He had long <laughs> blonde hair. His name was Steve Smith. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, but uh -huh. he came up with the whole concept and he just started putting, you know, um, uh, artists on the air. That was the way he was co-signing his station and it worked. And so I was like, damn, I got to get on that radio station. So um, while I was in college, I was sending out tapes and I had made friends with this guy in North Carolina who had a progressive radio station. Because, you know, those stations in the South, like... Um, uh, obviously Atlanta, mm -hmm. um, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. They, I mean, if back then you would go to those cities and they were just, they were playing, you know, whatever they needed to play album cuts. It just was sounded so edgy. Mm. So I sent my tape to the guy and he was like, you sound really good. He was basically mentoring me. And he told me one day that, you know, that Steve Smith was consulting that radio station. So he played my tape and the guy was like, Stephen Smith was like, who's that? He was like, oh, this girl named Cherry, Cherry Bomb, Cherry Martinez. He was like, yo, she's the bomb for real. And he thought about me when they had an opening and he called me personally and was like, yo, I know you want to be in New York. I'm like, is this really Steve Smith calling my phone? And this is all, like I said, buzz, no social media. I don't know how he got my phone number. He probably got it from that guy. But anyways, um. He calls me up and was like, you know, there's an opening in L.A., you know, for that's our sister station. I think you do well there. So, you know, um, yeah. So stuff like that was just so organic. Like, that's organic. Yeah. <laughs> that's really organic, you know. And it was just it was just it was nice. You know, it was nice. I, I, I say I was on radio tour because I was really jumping. Around. Everybody's like, Cherry, you're crazy. You're going to burn yourself out. You're staying at jobs for three for three months, four months, six months. You're not even staying there to like really plant. Your I was like, I know where I want to go. I want to mm -hmm. be in New York. I'm not staying in these places. Mm -hmm. So sure enough, my last gig was in Philly and I was there and I was I was really just you know, chilling because, you know, I was comfy, you What's know, because Philly's close to New York. It, it was close to Boston. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't on the like in the Midwest or on the West Coast. So I was cool in Philly. I was like, all right, I could do Philly. And um, I ended up bumping into the guy that gave me my first chance in radio in Detroit. And he was like, I started this new radio station in New York. It's called Power 105. We've been up for a couple of months and I need your voice. You know, so, and again, there was no social media. You yeah. know, that was me just randomly bumping into him at a 112 listening party. 
that Jay Z showed up to. You know, it was just like crazy. Tom. So, um, yeah, I started doing weekends. All of a sudden, after two weeks, I mean, after two months, he's like, "We'd like to have a meeting with you." I didn't know what it was about. I said, "Okay, I'll drive up." You know, because I'm in Philly. You know, because I was only you know working on the weekends. Mm -hmm. I go up there. They were like, "We're gonna have an opening for you." Um, we're gonna have an opening at night. And we would love for you to take this slot. So I don't I don't even know if I told y'all too much or if I jumped off topic, but I was just nah, you're doing good. You're doing good. Okay. So yeah, so I, I came on, I was doing nights, it was beautiful, and you know, that was it. The station was basically built around me because they got rid of everybody. You know, and they, you know, because the people that were there when I first got there didn't end up being there. And I became part of that winning, you know, team, you know, that they were building. You know, that was like, we're going to keep Cherry, but we need someone new for here. We need this one. We need a new morning show. And it was, it was just nice to be regarded in that way, you know, and to really be part of a team like that. So that's, that's my story. And then I think maybe in, 2006 or 2007 all of a sudden twitter pops up i'm like what is this <laughs> it was so weird i like i feel like i'm talking to myself but mm -hmm. that's what it was yeah so you you, talk, you talked earlier on about having to do tapes and you said that i was interested like what what consists on a, like an audition tape for a radio personality do they want to hear your words do they want to hear how you flow on the mic do they want to hear your music selection and the flow you do like what how does that come about? Like, what kind of tape do you have to come up with? Well, yeah. So, you know, for those of us that are in radio, we yeah. know that you don't program your own radio station. So the music's already preset, pre-programmed. Right. But the way that it's designed um, is that as soon as you turn the mic on is when the tape starts rolling. Mm. So you're really only getting like you're hearing like the ending of this Chris Brown song you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, then you hear me talk, then you hear me intro a new song, and yeah. then maybe you hear another 10, 15 seconds, and boom, we do it again. Gotcha, gotcha. So it's just very quick, but you get the, you get the, you get the gist. Right, you, right. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So for you just doing that, that right there, and sending that out, they, that something was resonating enough in there for you to get, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And that was what Steve Smith was, you know, I guess, you know, because he was consulting, part of consulting is coming down to the radio station. So he mm -hmm. was at the station, he was in the program director's office and the guy was like, hey, listen to this girl, wow. you know, and plays it. And the guy's like, who the hell is that? And then when a job opens up, he thinks about me. Dope. Okay, so what, what year you said about 06, 07, you go to Power 105? No, I was at oh, I, I was at Power like two thousand and three. Okay, how how long did you how long were you there? I was there till about twenty fifteen. Okay, so you were there when the Breakfast Club was there. Oh yeah, when they were when they first right. developed. Yeah, my program director, right. that was his idea. He put the whole thing together. They sounded awful. Wow. Oh my god. Really? What? But he knows how to develop talent. Okay. Cadillac Jack, I'm telling you, this man yeah, is yeah, a yeah. genius. Yeah, go. And what he would do is, as soon as they got off the air, you see that tape that I just told you about? Mm -hmm. He'd say, bring the tape in. Oh, and dissect it. He'd bring the tape in and they dissect it word for word. And with a morning show, it's even more critical because he's like, how can you say that in less words? Because you got three voices. So not only is he developing brevity, but he's also developing personality in that brief moment. So that's why you got Charlemagne saying waffle color niggas and that shit is funny. He don't need to say no more, but that's the personality that right there, you already know who he is. Right. And you have, you know, Envy who opens up, he's the quarterback, you know what I mean? So it's like everybody plays these different roles and it's, it's that detailed. And that then it becomes smooth, then it becomes, you know, magical. Then you got that chemistry. And then it's like you have everybody that plays a part, the voice of reason, the troublemaker, you know, the person that, you know, tries to bring everything together, you know, that kind of thing. 
that, that's that's pretty deep because us on the outside, we're kind of thinking that is it was chemistry from the start, like it was great from the start. No, that's great that you share that with us. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's amazing to me. You know, radio was just so fascinating. You know that you could really use your voice and you know create literally theater of the mind and you didn't have like i would go to work in sweats it didn't matter right it didn't matter what i wore as long as i sounded sexy right i was good <laughs> it's a, we, we got to pay homage because there wouldn't be podcasting there wouldn't be the ability to have these microphones if it weren't for people who did the grunt work within radio who had to take and put tapes in it and doing intros and doing outros to pave the way to do this it's such an amazing thing we appreciate you for that you said Hot 97 was the pinnacle. That's where you wanted to go. And at the time, you get into Power 105, and lo and behold, those two stations become bitter rivals, and eventually Power ends up taking over the place that you grew up loving. How was that moment? How, talk about, take us through that. Man, it's full circle for me because it's like I wanted to be down with Hot 97 so bad. You know what I'm saying? And and I remember when I left LA, I came to New York and I started working part-time because you had to work your way up. They weren't like, one thing about Hot 97, they really, they respect the people that work for them. You know what I'm saying? And they really, well, I don't know, the people, it, it, the, the players, you know what I mean? And so it's really seniority. You know what I mean? If you pay your dues, you know, they, at that time, I knew that just because I had this name at LA, they weren't going to let me come in and, you know what I mean? Unless they hired me for that slot. So me coming in doing part-times, I had to work at 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. Or just these weird hours. And that didn't work for me. So I ended up leaving and I went to BLS where I had a stable, you know, a stable um, time slot. You know, I was working with Ace on the weekends because I was edgy. You know what I mean? So, you know, they put me on at night with with Ace and we used to have fun in the mix show and all that stuff. And I was working in Boston too. So I was, you know, working Monday through Friday in Boston and then Saturday and Sunday in, in New York. And I was doing that for like three years. It was so hard going back and forth, back and forth. And I had my son. Mm. So, um, you know, just... In my mind, I'm like, damn, I, I appreciated the opportunity being at BLS, but my heart was like, I wanted, you know, I wanted more of that 187 vibe. You know what I'm saying? Because I knew what I wanted to do personally for my personal brand. So when this new station pops up, I'm appreciative of the of the opportunity, but we were playing. It, we it, To me, it sounded like we were kind of like misfits <laughs> a little bit because it was like you had all the people that Hot 97 fired that was working at the station, right? Yeah. And then you had us playing like all of these like throwbacks and, you know, but it was still mixed in with some current stuff and it just didn't, we didn't know who we were. You know what I mean? So it was like, who the hell are we? We need to go harder. Everybody was like, can we play this? Can we play the camera? Can we, you know, whatever was popping at that time, you know, we were just trying to promote it. And right. they were like, no, we got to, we're going after the women, you know? So it was, it was a long road of trying to find who we were. And then eventually when Cadillac came in, he's like, we're going after 1834 men and women. Mm. We're not just going after women. We're going after men and women. And that was music to our ears. Mm. 